Backpacker Magazine called this one of the hardest day hikes in the United States. With over 10,000 feet of climbing and 21 miles of hiking, this is Cactus to Clouds, the legendary Cactus to Clouds. Hey everyone, in this video, I'm gonna show you how to hike cactus to clouds. Now, as you're watching the video, if you're finding it helpful, if you can give me a little thumbs up, it's an easy way to say thank you for the video. And to start, let me just say that this is not a hike where you just kind of show up and hike it. You need to plan it. You need to make sure you are doing it uh, at the right time so that you don't get hurt or potentially die. People have just shown up to do this, not knowing what they're getting into and have gotten into a lot of trouble, uh, including heat stroke and death. So don't let that be you. So let's go ahead and jump back onto the computer and do a little planning before we get into the hike itself. The hike starts in Palm Springs, California. It's about an hour and a half with uh, no traffic from Los Angeles, about 100 miles. And the actual trailhead is right at the Palm Springs Art Museum, which is right in town. So if you're staying at a hotel or something, you can actually just walk to the trailhead and start hiking there. You can't park in the parking lot here, unfortunately. I'll talk about places where you can park on the website. But the trails are right here in the back of the Art Museum. It's also an access point for a whole series of trails here in the Palm Springs area, which are shorter and also pretty great. I have a bunch of those on the website as well. From there, we're gonna to go to the summit of Mount San Jacinto. And then from the summit, we're gonna go back down to the tram station. And once you get to the tram station, you can just buy a ticket at the tram station there. There's also restaurants and everything. And then you're just gonna take the tram um, back down a few thousand feet, the few thousand feet that you climbed up earlier, all the way back down to the uh, tram station at the valley. And then once you're here, there's Wi-Fi. You can either park a car here. It costs to pay to park there, but you can just use Wi-Fi and get a ride share. And it's only about 15 minutes to get back to the, um, the area where you started the hike at the art museum. All right, here's the hike, starting at the art museum down here, up to the summit, and then back down to the tram. Now, I like to break the hike down into logical chunks that help me kind of give me checkpoints along the way in terms of do I turn around or keep going and also help me just mentally tackle this long and very tough day. The first section I have starts down here at the art museum. We climb right out of the gate up to an area called the picnic tables, which is a popular day hiking spot, albeit a, a tough one. And then we're going to go up to rescue one at rescue one. I use this as a spot to assess whether I should keep going or not really between rescue one and the tram station. There's not a lot going on. There's, there's no water. Um, it's a tough trail to come back down because it's marked basically for hikers going uphill. So rescue one's a good point. Go no-go point. If you're not feeling good, this is definitely a place to turn around. If you are going to keep going, you can see this red section here. We definitely have some more uphill going. We do have a couple of uh, areas where it's kind of flat, flat, maybe not so flat, but not so steep. Uh, past Rescue 2, all the way up to an area called Flat Rock, which is a good place to take a break because then the real work starts. From Flat Rock, we have a very steep climb through the Manzanita here up to an area called the Traverse. And the Traverse is basically the trickiest part, I'd say, of this whole hike. We're going to, as the name implies, laterally cross the face here. This is a very steep face. It often gets uh, covered in debris that falls down after the winter. You know, trees get heavy with snow, trees fall down, and this part can be a little tricky. We're going to come over here to Kaufman Craig, which is Crag, which is this. Doesn't really show on the satellite photo. Uh, and then from there, we have a really, really steep, not even, I don't even think this is a half a mile up to Grubbs Notch, but it'll probably take you an hour. It's so steep. I think the grades are about 50%. And then from Grubbs Notch, the, uh, the tough part of the day is done. By this point, you've climbed about 8,000 feet. If you want to bail out, you can easily bail out. It's about 10 minutes to the tram station. Otherwise, you're going to go through Long Valley, which is right here. It's an area of flat. We're going to go up through Long Valley. Once we pass there, we do the sharp turn. We start climbing again. Here is Round Valley. This is a campground. There is bathrooms there and some seasonal water. And then we're gonna get up to Wellman Divide. Now from Wellman Divide, it's just one section up to the top. We're gonna to do this, it's, it's, it's a climb, it's a long gradual climb 
up. This is Gene Peak right there. We're going to do this big, long uh, switch back and then get up to San Jacinto Summit. From there, we go back down San Jacinto Summit the same way. And then when we get back down to the tram, we go down to the tram station and just take the tram down from here. So that's the hike. You can break it up however you want to break it up. I find these uh, sections work well for me. So let's talk about the best time to do this hike. The challenge is that you have two weather extremes. At the bottom, you have the Sonoran Desert. Temperatures in Palm Springs have gone over 120 Fahrenheit, and in the summer, they're commonly over 110 Fahrenheit. At the top, you have an alpine environment. You're over 10,000 feet. You have snow, you have ice, you have wind chill. So finding the right time to do this hike is very important. First off, what I would say is if you're planning this in advance, the best time to plan it is sort of late fall, early winter, somewhere around late September to maybe December. That's usually the sweet spot where it's cool enough in Palm Springs and the summit area hasn't been covered in snow. So that's the best time to do it. Winter, it can get pretty sloppy on the upper parts of the Skyline Trail and the Traverse. It's not some place you can really just hike across. Uh, it's very variable in terms of the conditions. It can be treacherous. There can be falling ice. You don't want to mess around with it if you've never done it before. If you want to go up to the summit from the tram, that's usually doable in the winter. Enough people do that. You can usually do that with micro spikes and trekking poles when the conditions are okay, but the traverse and the upper skyline are not good in the winter. The next real window is in around May. In May, the temperatures are still cool enough for maybe April even, still cool enough in Palm Springs that you're okay. And the summit is usually getting clear of snow. The traverse can be sloppy. The traverse section is uh, shaded. It usually has ice and snow much longer than the rest of the trail. So just something to be aware of. If you have an opportunity to do it in the fall, do it the fall. The May is sort of a second best April, May, but it can be sloppy. It can be dangerous. So just a heads up. And then in the summertime, it's usually just too hot to do it. Now, people have done it in the summer. I've done it in the summer. That was after doing it at least a dozen times before. If you know what you're doing and you time the temperature right, you can kind of do it whenever the conditions are okay and the trail is okay. I'll talk about that in a second. But in general, the summer is not a time to do it, especially if you're doing it the first time. Now, what you have going for you is that as you climb, the temperature goes down. And it's, it's not an exact science. It's somewhere between three and five degrees Fahrenheit per 1,000 feet of climbing. So what you can do is you can look at the hourly forecast for Palm Springs if it's on the warmer side and basically estimate your pace going uphill. And then for every 1,000 feet, take off, say, 4 Fahrenheit to estimate what the temperature is going to be as you climb. And if you do that, you know, even if the high is maybe somewhere around 90 in Palm Springs, if you leave super early in the morning while, you know, the low temperatures might be in the 70s, you can get up to 6,000, 7,000, 8,000 feet by the time the temperature is at its height in Palm Springs at the beginning of the hike. So that's a common way to do it. You're also going to want to leave early in order just to give yourself time to do the hike. The hike is a long hike. You're going to go much slower. People generally go much slower because of the climbing. A general rule is if you take your normal pace, so if you normally hike at, say, three miles an hour, just to cut that in half. So if you're doing three miles an hour, it's like a 20-minute uh, mile. Cut that in half. Now it's like a 40-minute mile you're going to do. Uh, some sections that are going to be like a thousand feet of climbing in a mile it's really steep expect to go slower than normal at least up to grubs notch there's not really a lot of places where you can kind of uh, pick up the pace there there's a couple little breathers but in general it's a tough uphill climb eight thousand feet of climbing in around nine miles or so so plan accordingly now i have a spreadsheet on the website if you go to hikingguy.com and you find this guide that you can copy and you can put in your start time, you can put in your pace, and you can also put in a temperature and kind of get an estimated timetable of how long it'll take you to get up to the top. I definitely recommend doing this. And uh, the other thing, as long as we're talking about timing, the tram shuts down uh, usually for a couple of weeks in the fall, usually it's September. So I'll put a link to the tram website on the guide as well check that out. You definitely don't want to hike up to the top and then find the tram is closed and you have to hike back down. 
that would be no bueno. So uh, make sure the tram is open. And again, I'll put that information on the website. All right, so let's talk about these white dots like you see here behind me. Now, when you leave, most of the time you're gonna be leaving in the dark so you can beat the heat. And when you do, it's kind of hard to follow the trail. It's not a big like national park type trail. It does get a little sketchy, a little hard to follow at points. So what you're gonna do is when you have your headlamp on, you're gonna be looking for these white dots along the way. And you should see them rather regularly. As you get further up, they kind of disappear a little bit. They're maintained by the local hiking club and uh, they're definitely helpful. So when you first start out, headlamp on and then go basically white dot to white dot. If you don't see a white dot for a while, you might wanna check against your electronic navigation. I highly recommend downloading the GPX file uh, that I have on my website, putting it on your phone using an app like uh, Gaia GPS or similar, or handheld Garmin GPS, whatever you might have, and regularly checking it, especially if you're not seeing these white dots. You're gonna to wanna to check against your electronic navigation when it's dark out. When it gets light, the trail is pretty easy to follow. It does break apart and come back together a, a few points, but if you basically, if you take a trail and it sort of fizzles out, you're probably in the wrong place. There's enough people going here that the path is pretty well worn, so it should be easy to follow again, especially during the daylight at night new batteries in your headlamp, charge it up so that they don't run out in the middle of this. Look for these white dots and you should be all set. All right, let's talk about hiking gear. This is a proper backcountry hike. You need proper backcountry hiking gear. If you don't know what that is, you probably should not be doing this hike. Some items I specifically find helpful here are trekking poles. Even if you don't use them all the time, they will definitely be helpful on the steep slopes here. Also, you're going up to the summit, which is basically an alpine environment. The weather can change. I bring a layer or two, a beanie, and a shell just to be prepared for uh, very cold, rainy, windy, maybe even snowy conditions at the summit, even if it's nice in Palm Springs. There is cell phone reception on maybe the first half of the Skyline Trail, but I always bring it in reach just in case I need to hit SOS. Whether for me or for somebody else I find on the trail, I bring an inridge with me. Um, you know, this is the back country and things do happen here. Let's talk about water because that's the big one. What I do is I take three liters of water from the art museum up to Long Valley. Now, it seems maybe seems like a lot. It depends on how hot it is or cool it is. But three liters seems to be the sweet spot to get me up there about nine and a half, ten miles of hiking. You will be going slower than normal because it is steeper um, and you don't want to have to carry like six liters of water on your back because it'll just be heavier. So I take three liters there and then I refill up at Long Valley. And the best place or the easiest place to refill is behind the ranger station. There's a spigot there. I'll put a link to the website for the ranger station on my website. You might just want to call. There's, I believe there's a phone in that ranger station. Call and just make sure that water is running. It's always been running whenever I've done the hike over the years, but there's water there. You can also go to the tram station, not super convenient, but you can do that and get water at the soda fountain area. And there is um, a little well and water spout at Round Valley Campgrounds. It's actually fed by a reservoir that's fed by a snow melt. Uh, it runs most of the time, late fall, not so great. I've seen it dry at times in the summer when we were in drought years. In the spring, it should be raging. It should be all you need. But you have three options there. So Art Museum to Long Valley, three liters, refill at Long Valley, and another three liters should be enough to get to the summit and back. Another thing is snacks and electrolytes. Because you're in the desert, you're generally sweating a lot more. Uh, having some kind of electrolytes help. I'll generally bring a bottle of Gatorade that I'll drink at Flat Rock. It gives me like a boost of sugar and electrolytes for that last little steep, steep section up past uh, Kaufman's Crag up to Grubb's Notch. So that helps. I know also people take uh, energy gels and they'll have some energy gels there on the way up as well. So you're going to want to have snacks. There's no real place to buy snacks along the way except for the tram station, which is not super convenient. I wouldn't want to do uh, cactus to clouds and stop at the tram station on the way unless I was bailing out. So bring everything you need food wise, liquids you can uh, replenish on the way up. If you want to know what gear I'm using, I have a full page hikingguy.com forward slash gear. I keep updated all the time. I'm always trying new gear. 
trying new things out. And I just put up here what I actually use and what makes the cut. There's no sponsorships or promotions. So if you're in the market for new gear, please check that out. And if you use the links on that page, uh, it helps support the site as well. So thank you for those of you, those of you who do that. All right, here we are at the Art Museum Trailhead. I'd recommend checking out the trail board before you go, just making sure there's no notices or closures here. The Skyline Trail is closed once in a while. Uh, definitely check the park websites to make sure that it's not closed. I think they put it on Twitter last year. Now, the biggest challenge in the beginning is not going on to private property. There's a lot of signs here, and the trail is pretty easy to follow, but I have seen golf course employees yelling at people who, I guess, went off the trail not too friendly but you could see it's steep from the gun and even if you were to come here and do the trail to the picnic tables it's still a very challenging hike even though it's not far right from the start you're going to start seeing the white blazes thank you uh, coachella valley hiking club i think that's who does these now as you go if you don't see white blazes in front of you you're going to want to look back to either side or look back uphill because the trail does have a lot of little switchbacks here and because it's so rocky, they can sometimes be hard to spot. You can also see sort of the steepness of the rocks here. It's one of those things where you're gonna engage your, your quads quite a bit as you step up these rocks. It's not an even trail, although there are little sections like this where you do get a bit of a breather as you go up, but they are few and far between here in this beginning part up to the picnic benches. Now, as you go up, you'll probably be doing this in the dark and get nice views down at the Palm Springs. Sometimes you can hear people screaming and parties going on and all of that fun stuff. And sometimes you can see bighorn uh, sheep like this. This is pretty awesome. I don't always see this, but uh, on this trip, I was lucky enough to see a few dozen bighorn here. I have seen deer on the upper, mule deer on the upper uh, parts of the trail, but this is very cool. Right here, there's the golf course. We're still maybe 20 minutes up from the start here. And obviously, if you do see a bighorn, uh, just give them their space. They are endangered in this part of the world. These are desert bighorn. They're a little bit different than the other ones, so very cool. This first mile is tough. You can see me huffing and puffing here. This is probably, for me at least, the hardest part uh, after the traverse, which will come a little bit later, I'll show you. But the part from the art museum to the picnic benches is steep, it's rocky, and uh, right away, you're gonna have to start working for it. And you're gonna kind of move away from town. You're gonna get out of sight of it. And if you look up in the distance, you see a notch. That's where the picnic benches are. Skyline Trail is a series of notches that you look up to and aspire to climb up. And here we are at the picnic benches, about a mile in done just under a thousand feet of climbing. There's picnic benches. They're pretty easy to see if you have a headlamp in the dark. What you're gonna wanna do is make the hard left here. And you'll see a trail sign for the North Lycan Trail. This is part of the trail system I mentioned earlier around uh, Palm Springs. We're only on this for a second. And then when you get to this big pile of rocks here at the junction for North Lycan, we're gonna bear to the right and head up on the Skyline Trail. And from here on out, there's not really any side trails or connecting trails until we get up to Long Valley or basically on the Skyline Trail all the way up to the top here. And when you get to this point right after that junction or the climb, going to make the hard left. There was a little use trail going down there and you have some of these painted signs, Long Valley, eight miles. That's where we're going. That's the end of the what's considered the toughest part of the cactus to clouds hike. And you can see the trail is pretty easy to follow here. Here's that warning rock. You might have seen some pictures of it. No water. What's interesting, it says eight miles, 10 hours. It gives you an idea of how steep it is. So once you pass the warning, the white blazes kind of die out. And I've been here different times. There's white blazes, there's not white blazes, but generally the trail is not as rocky. It's a little bit easier to follow. And if you don't know where you are, just stop right away and consult your electronic navigation, your GPS, or your phone, or whatever it might be. Uh, if you have the GPX loaded on a smartwatch, 
where you can check on a map, that's helpful too, because you can always just glance down and make sure you're in the right place. That's generally what I do, uh, just to give myself little cross checks every couple minutes to make sure um, I'm not hiking off trail. But anyway, let's keep going. By this point, you should be getting into the groove of climbing the, um, basically the gradient and the angle here is pretty consistent with a normal section of hiking, which is basically steep uphill. But you can see it's not too tough. There are some sections that do mellow out a little bit. You get some nice views down into Coachella Valley, Toro Peak. And there's this newer sign here saying, be careful, know what you're doing. Uh, obviously, this is helpful for people who maybe just show up and do the hike and don't know what they're getting into. But we're going to climb up a series of switchbacks on our way up to Rescue One, which will be the next landmark here. And this is just beautiful, beautiful terrain, really rocky, really dramatic uh, boulders here. If it's night, you're not going to see this. And when you get to this interesting rock, you're going to get nice views down into the wind farm. But this is a place where it's easy to get lost, and I've gotten lost here. When you get to that rock, you're going to make sure you make the hard left here. Hard left and continue up along the side of the ridge. There is a trail to the right that kind of peters out and goes down into that canyon a little bit. It's not a good place to be. So that funky rock, go over here and start climbing uphill. And you can see how steep it is. We're going to go up along the side of a ridge here and, uh, you know, same, same MO, steep uphill, do your best. Here we are at Rescue One. Now this is a rescue box that the Sheriff's Department, I believe, put in. And if you look in it, there is water and snacks. And if you are in need of that, if you are in bad shape, you can take from it. Obviously don't take from it if you don't need it. And if you wanna leave something in there, you can also do that. So here we are at Rescue One. At this point, I'd say you need to do a gut check and basically commit to going up or go back. If you're not feeling it, there's no shame in going back. You're only about two and a half miles at this point. You're within cell phone range of Palm Springs. You could probably be back at the trailhead in an hour or call 911 if you had to. But from this point, you're really going to want to commit to getting to the top. When you look at people who have died here, uh, one of the common threads is that they go up and then they try to come back down and it gets too hot. So instead of outrunning the temperature by going up and getting that cooling effect like we talked about earlier, you know, they come back into the warmer air and then have problems with the heat. So rescue one, if you're gonna do it, keep going. If you're not feeling it or, you know, if, if you're just not sure, there's no shame in turning around and going back. It's still a, a beautiful, beautiful hike. But anyway, let's keep going. And uh, our next landmark will be rescue two. Once we pass rescue one, there's uh, kind of a confusing little area, flat area here with a bunch of trails. I think people have done some camping here, but the trail goes off to the left and continues uphill. You can see, if you look ahead, there's not really anywhere to go that's level. We're basically just going up to that ridge in the distance. But as you climb up here along the side of this ridge, and it kind of hugs this ridge over to the left over here, um, there are a lot of little splits and cutoffs. If you just take the main trail, which is usually a big switchback, it's usually a little easier. And if you look off to the right here, if it's daylight at this point, you can see San Gorgonio, which is the highest point in Southern California. And you'll also get nice views again down into the Coachella Valley, Palm Springs, as you continue uphill. It's hard, I, I think these shots kind of give you an idea of how steep it is, but it's just, you know, it's a steep one. But once you get to the top of this ridge and you kind of kind, kind of gain the edge of the ridge, it levels out a little bit and you'll start to see the larger mountains in the distance. And the big one kind of off to the left is Apache Peak, which is a fun one to climb. I have a guide for that on Hiking Guy as well, uh, but that's over there. That's that one in the distance. Here's a spray painted four mile marker as we continue here, we're about, I don't know, halfway or so done on the skyline trail portion. And we're heading up uh, to those higher mountains in the distance. So I'm about halfway up to Long Valley. I'm feeling decent. Really mentally, I look at this as two hikes. I look at this as art museum to Long Valley and then San Jacinto Peak. Mentally, I know if I can get to Long Valley, 
The rest of it is just sort of going through the motions. Not that it's easy necessarily, um, but in terms of like the toughest part, this is the toughest part. It feels like you're going uphill forever. There are a few breathers of a few, I don't know, a few yards or so that feel delicious uh, where you're not going uphill, but otherwise you're pretty much going uphill most of the time uh, up to this point, the halfway point. But anyway, let's keep going, uh, heading towards rescue two. Now, as we continue uphill, you're, you're gonna come around a corner and you're gonna get some great views of essentially the slopes that we're gonna finally climb up to Grubbs Notch. And there it is, that's Kaufman's Craig. It's easy to spot, the big rock outcropping. We're gonna go up from Flat Rock there, keep climbing up through that Manzanita, then do the Traverse, and then from there, go up to Grubbs Notch in this really steep section up here. So that's where we're going, but we have to basically navigate this ridge first. And if it's nighttime when you're doing this, you're gonna be able to see the tram light in the distance. That's what it looks like when you do the hike at night. It's a light that looks like a massive star as you climb up, but that's actually the tram station. So it gives you a good landmark as you climb up here. There's a little breather as we go, uh, I guess, west along the ridge. You get nice, warm, nice views down into the Coachella Valley as we continue along this little bit of a breather. But soon enough, we're gonna go uphill again and gain that ridge. I've heard people call it uh, the ridge that never ends, I think, it's the informal term. But as we go along here on the approach to the ridge, you're gonna get nice views of San Gorgonio. Hopefully it's the morning. It's nice when you're at this point and it's sunrise and the mountains got the alpine glow. But here we are up on the ridge. You can see the ridge unfolding in front of us. We have to go basically from here to Palm, or sorry, to Rescue 2 and then Flat Rock. Here's another sign for Palm Springs. One of the common threads of people who get in trouble is that they went up and when it was really hot out and then they went back down and lost the trail and uh, suffered from heat stroke. So if you've gone past rescue one, it's always better to commit and just go uh, straight uphill and get to Grubbs Notch. That's flat rock in the distance there. We're gonna just hike along this ridge until we get there. And once we start the ridge, you're gonna come up to a rescue two. Climbed about 5,000 feet at this point then about six and a half miles. It's a respectable day on a normal hike and we still have a lot more to go. There's Kaufman's Craig right in front of us. And we might have a mile or so here along the ridge, which is up and down, obviously more ups than downs. And then eventually we're gonna get to Flat Rock. Now Flat Rock is a usually dry waterfall. I don't think I've ever seen water flowing here, but this is the traditional place to stop, regroup, drink your drinks, have your snacks before the real climbing comes in. The next two miles or so are, are pretty brutal, but this is flat rock. The trail continues just across on the other side over there, but the views from flat rock are nice and usually there's a breeze coming up this chute. Just taking a break here at flat rock before I do the last mile or so up to the notch, which is a bit of a killer, but I thought it would be a good time to thank everyone who supports this website in any which way, this is not a sponsored video. There's no mattress, folding mattress, or green shakes or anything sponsoring this video. This is uh, done entirely with your support, uh, my work and my sweat here on the trail. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I could not do these guys without, do, uh, do these guys without you. I'm so tired, I can't talk. I might have to stop in the tram station and get a Coke or something, but uh, Anyway, thank you for your support. If you want to support the website, just go to hikingguy.com forward slash support. There's lots of different ways you can do it. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, let me catch my breath, have some water, and then head on up to the notch. All right, now it's time for the big kid pants. If you thought the 5,000 feet you just did were a lot, you're going to do a few thousand feet in about two miles right here. And the trail starts on the other side of Flat Rock. And this first section is a climb up through the uh, Manzanita. You can get a little overgrown at points, but if you look up there, you can get a view of Kaufman's Craig. That's where we're ultimately going right before the last steep part. But this kind of gives an idea of what the trail is like. I wouldn't say it's overgrown. The trail is definitely easy to follow through here. I've never had a problem, but you might get brushed up against uh, your legs as you hike here. 
This is one of the rare breathers in the section. It's hard to shoot and huff and puff going uphill here, but it is super, super steep. And here you can get an idea of how far up we're going. That's not Kaufman's Crag. That's one uh, to the east of it or to the left of it, but it gives you an idea of how steep the trail is here in this section. When you get closer to the top, it does mellow out a little bit. You'll be able to look down on the area that we just climbed up from, from Flat Rock, and even down to the ridge that we went across uh, when we came up from Rescue 2 and earlier from that Rescue 1. You're also going to start to see some uh, mountain pine trees here, which is cool. This little Christmas tree pine in the middle of nowhere, but we're going from the desert up into the alpine area. Now, towards the end of uh, the section before the traverse, you can see it's incredibly steep. So look how steep we're going. Some bigger, bigger pine trees, but the trail is definitely easier to follow. There are some switchbacks. You get a nice view into this canyon off to the left here before we cut back and head towards the traverse, which is our next uh, stop. All right, and then we come out at this little viewpoint here and you get a nice view up towards uh, the traverse. And the traverse is just up there by Kaufman's Crag. We're gonna cut across after a little climbing to the edge of the crag and then go up from there. Now here we are at the traverse. This is an area that's mainly level uh, and cuts across. And there, if we look off to the right, you can see the crag, which is our next destination. A little more suffering. The one thing when you go on the traverse, you have to make sure that you follow the path, the trail. Sometimes it can get a little washed out, a little funky, but just go slow. Make sure you're in the right place, check your GPS, and you should be okay. Like I said earlier, the, um, the fall is the best time to do this because paths have been sort of established through all of the debris that's fallen. But here you can see some of that debris that falls down the chute here at the traverse. And you do have a little bit of a downhill. If you don't know what traverse means, it's basically a, a flat or a lateral section when you're doing a climb or a descent. So a little break from the climb as we traverse the side of this ridge here. Some of the sections are rocky. You're going to want to look up for the trail. And again, there are some steep sections here, but you're going to keep going until we come out to Kaufman Crag. Now, when we get to the crag, we're not gonna go all the way to it. You're kind of on the side of it. And then we're gonna climb up to the left here. And this is a, a super tough section, probably the steepest gradients on the whole hike. Uh, we're basically just gonna go straight. And there's a few different splits, little use trails. People take different ways here. I do notice that there are some blazes here uh, this last year or two, so that should be helpful. But you're not going to go off to where the crag is. You're going to stay, keep the crag on your right, and climb up the steep, steep slope until you get up to uh, Grub's Notch. And like I said, there's a lot of different little trails, but there's definitely a trail you can follow. And I have a GPX file uh, that I used multiple times that you can follow as well up through here. And when you start to see the daylight peeking out through the trees, the main act of your Sufferfest called Cactus to Clouds is done. There's still some more hiking, but the toughest is behind you. Ho, 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 ho. Holy crow. I can't explain the feeling of getting to this point. It's a little bittersweet. You know, you got the hardest part behind you. But you also know that you're about halfway down the hike. Oh, man. All right. Here we are. We're going to make our way down to the tourist trail over here and uh, keep on going. There's a few different trails over here. There's a trail you'll see off to the left that goes through this split log. You don't want to take that. You, you can take it. It's just going to add a little bit of uh, mileage onto it. Instead, what you want to do is bear to the right and kind of go on what I think is a service trail. It goes by some maintenance sheds and everything. But this is your best move just to go over to the right, and that will bring you right over to the uh, walkway by the tram station. Now, having just finished that really, really incredible hike, I mean... You'd, you'd be challenged to find a hike where you're doing 8,000 feet of climbing um, anywhere, a day hike, 
Now you're going to do about 2,500, 2,600 more up to the summit. So you really need to ask yourself, can you do it? Because what's going to happen is if you're burnt out at this point, if you're just, you know, so tired that you don't know what to do, don't push yourself to the summit because when you get tired, you make mistakes. It still is pretty far. I'd say go bail out at the tram station, come back up the tram and finish it up in two parts. Uh, you know, just coming up from the tram and hiking up to the summit. Don't put yourself in danger because you're so tired. But if you're feeling good, uh, we're about halfway there. So let's keep hiking. And once you start seeing a lot of people, you know you're getting close. It's a little surreal after being on that fairly isolated and tough trail. But here we are. When we come back for the tram, we're going to make the right up this paved path to the station. Or if you want to bail out, that's the way to go. But otherwise, you're going to make the left here, and we're going to go over to the ranger station, which is the next stop. This is Long Valley. You can see all the tourists who came up on the tram. Now at the ranger station, you have to get a free permit, and it's also a good place to ask any questions or maybe check in uh, on conditions with the rangers here. And you just go up the stairs. There's a little permit station right there. And it's pretty simple. Like I said, it's free. You don't have to do anything. You just fill the permit out. You put the blue copy in the permit box on the left here. You keep the white copy with you or the bottom copy. And then we're going to return the bottom copy at the end. There are toilets here if you need to go. This is a good place. And around the back is a spigot uh, where you can refill your water, like I mentioned earlier. Once you got your permit, we're going to continue on. Now the trail is well marked from here. We're going to be heading towards San Jacinto Peak. And you can see there's a sign that says you need a permit from on from here on out. And the rest of this hike, while it is uphill and it is challenging, uh, it's not anything as tough or as confusing as the rest or the beginning of the hike. Here you can see another trail junction. There's a few little loop trails around here that are not as tough, but we're going to go up to the peak. It says six miles. You know the mileage on these signs if you're not familiar with them. It's usually a loose estimate here. Now, once you get to the, the sign where it says Round Valley Trail, that's a um, basically going to be a campground that we're going to stop at on the way up here. We're not going to stop there. We're going to go by there. But once you pass that, that uh, sign there, we're going to start to climb once again. Now, these gradients are not as tough as the earlier ones. There's generally a lot of switchbacks. It's not easy in any way. And it's rocky and it can be a little funky going. It's not a real cruisy trail, um, but it is a lot easier than it was before. And here you can see we'll go through these really cool boulder fields as we climb up. And it also gives you an idea of the steepness here. And any regular day, this is a steep climb, this part after the tram. But after what you did, it's, it's kind of whatever. There are signs here for some of the loop trails and some of the other options for the day hikes. We're going to keep heading towards San Jacinto Peak. Once you pass that sign, we're sort of entering the outskirts of the Round Valley campground area. These are your last toilets. These are primitive uh, pit toilets, but if you have to go in private, this is your best move here, these toilets at Round Valley. And then if you continue on, you'll see these little posts. These are for the campgrounds at Round Valley. And if you wanted to camp here, you could do it. I wouldn't recommend doing skyline trail and camping because it would be kind of heavy to carry all that gear up here. And again, lots of signs, really well marked. And you should see a lot of day hikers who have come up on the tram and who are coming up to bag the summit. If you want to do that, that's a great hike to do before you do Cactus to Clouds. Um, and I have that guide on my website as well. As we continue towards the campground, you're going to see around Valley in there, a beautiful alpine uh, meadow. At one point, it was all grazed by cattle and then just messed up. The irrigation was all messed up. And I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, they, they fixed all of it so it irrigates naturally now. And it's more of a natural environment. Here we are at the junction for Round Valley. And if you wanted to refill your water, it might not be running here, but here you can see the summit is up to the left, but there is the water um, source right here. Purify and filter before drinking. I should have mentioned that earlier in the gear. You're going to want a water filter here. As always, you should always probably purify your water when you're hiking in the backcountry, but that's where it is. And then we're going to make the left and uh, do maybe a mile or so of uphill up to Wellman Divide, which is our next 
landmark on the hike. As you go through here, you can see there's a little seasonal ranger station and there's some old ruins. I'm not sure what these are from. If you know, leave me a comment, but I'd imagine from like the old ranger station or maybe there was a boy scout camp here. But we're gonna continue. It's a little bit flat in the beginning, but then we're gonna go uphill once again, as you do when you're climbing mountains. And we have about a mile or so, like I said, of uphill until we get to Wellman Divide. Now, when we get to Wellman Divide, the trail continues off to the right. And you can kind of see it going off there to the right. But there's a nice viewpoint, which is straight ahead, that I recommend checking out here at Wellman Divide. Going to get great views at this point off to the west. And they're looking west here. This is our first opportunity to look west. We basically climbed the tall mountains by Palm Springs, and now we're able to look uh, south and west from here. Then you're going to make the right from there, and you're going to get to Wellman Divide. This is our last kind of big uh, landmark before we get to the summit. Done about 13 and a half miles. We're just under 10,000 feet. And from here, we're going to go up through the Manzanita and climb up on the final push to the summit. So Wellman Divide is a great place to stop, have a break, fuel up, drink some water before the last couple miles up to the summit. Uh, we still have to do some climbing, but this next part is going to be one of my favorite parts. The trees kind of thin out. We're going to go through the Manzanita and we're going to get beautiful views of some of the surrounding peaks here. Uh, but it is uphill, but at least the views are nice. So we got that going for us. All right, let's go. As you continue up the trail, you're going to get nice views of Cornell Peak, which was named uh, by an early geologist who was mapping these peaks, or a USGS worker who named it after his alma mater. But people always ask about that pointy peak. And this part of this trail, is, it's a little bit tough because it's rocky. It's hard to kind of get your footing, but it's pretty straightforward. It's all exposed, and then we have this section in the middle with these awesome uh, rock formations and boulders, weathered boulders here, where it's a little bit wooded. But in general, it's a pretty easy or pretty straightforward shot up this trail. We're going to navigate through this boulder field. When we come back out into the Manzanita, you can get some nice uh, clear line of sight down into the Coachella Valley, down into Palm Springs, and to the south, the high point is called uh, Toro Peak, which is the highest point in the Santa Rosa and San Jacinto wilderness. So enjoy the views and keep on hiking. And you're going to want to be on the lookout for a switchback off to the left. Usually it's blocked. You can see there's some debris there blocking the forward path. We're going to cut back to the left and right up there is San Jacinto Peak. But when you cut back to the left, you're going to be able to see the trail here. And this is an established trail. It's not any kind of shortcut or anything. This is the trail trail as it continues up here. More great views to the south, to the east. And you can see uh, when you look down below the area that we came up just before this, down on those slopes there, when we came up to the Manzanita. At this point, I'm usually pretty oh. knackered, but it's not much longer to go. Just a mile or so up to the top. And eventually you're going to kind of wind back around to the right and come up to the saddle. And this is a big trail junction. Um, we're going to be going straight up here for the final last push to the saddle. But there is a trail off to the left, and that goes down to the Idlewild area. It connects with uh, Little Round Valley. When you come back down, don't go down there. You want to go to Round Valley, not Little Round Valley. That will put you in an entirely different place. It will be a much more expensive Uber ride to get back. But we're going to follow the rocky trail up here until we get um, to the refuge hut, which was built in the 1930s. You'll see it peeking through the trees right there. If you're ever caught here in a storm or you can't get out or you do your inreach and you have to wait up here, the hut is the place to stay. And I, I know people who know people who have stayed here in emergencies. This is what it looks like on the inside. A lot of search and rescue type of equipment. Please be respectful. Uh, don't come in here if you don't have to. I just want to show you what it looks like. But you can see people have tagged it, unfortunately. But this is the refuge hut. And once you leave there, you're going to continue to go uphill, kind of go around to the right a little bit. And this part to the summit is a little bit of a choose your own adventure. There is a trail, um, but it is rocky as well, so sometimes it's hard to find the trail. And again, if you have the GPX file, you can just consult the GPX on your navigation device and see where you are. But here you can see the trail is really easy to follow. 
But once we sort of twist around and we get into the bigger boulders, it's more of a choose your own adventure. As long as you're going straight up through the middle there to the highest point, you should be okay. It's not really dangerous. Here you can see there are footprints. You can look for footprints in the dirt between the boulders as clues. There's a lot of them all over the place because people kind of go whichever way they go, but you can see how steep it is. One last steep part as we go up. When I was doing this, a Cal Fire plane was buzzing the summit. It was so cool. Never saw that before, but really awesome. And you can also just walk across the actual granite. Sometimes this is a little bit easier than looking for a spot through the granite, just going right up and over it. When I got close to the top, this guy came back. How awesome is that? Yeah. All right. And here you are up at the summit area. That's it. You just climbed about 10,400 feet ish. There's a summit sign. Uh, usually there's one here. Sometimes there's none. Sometimes there's multiples, but you can take a picture with a summit sign. And you can also check out the panoramic views here. You can see west. Uh, on a clear day, you could probably see out to Catalina in the Pacific Ocean, but most of the time you can see Saddleback Mountain, which is over uh, the edge of Riverside and Orange County. And if you continue over to the right, you can see Angeles National Forest, Mount Baldy. You can see the wind is blowing me around here. It's definitely windy up top here. And then off to the right again is San Gorgonio, which we saw earlier. That's the highest point and a very fun hike. There's a few different routes up to the top there. And then if you continue around, you can see down into the Coachella Valley, Palm Springs area. Really great views from up here. Don't forget to get your shot with the peak sign. So that's it, we did it. I recommend just fueling up here for the uh, hike back down. You gotta watch your footing on the way down because it is rocky and you're probably pretty tired at this point. I know I am uh, and it's real easy to roll an ankle. So. Make sure that you're fueled up, you're kind of with it, you're watching your footing, and uh, you should be okay. It's going to be about five, six miles back down to the tram. So let me grab a bite to eat, and then uh, we'll head on back down. Going back down can be tough. It's been a long day at this point. At least it's downhill, and there are some beautiful sights like this crazy tree with a bunch of uh, huge branches or trunks growing out of it. I really love this area, really, really beautiful. But eventually you're gonna get back down to the ranger station. You'll probably hear people, you'll see a lot of day hikers on the way down. This is where you get out your copy of the permit and you just put it back in the box so that they can reconcile the permits at the end of the day and make sure that everyone who signed a permit and went onto the mountain actually came off of the mountain. Now the cruelest thing about this hike is that you've just climbed over 10,000 feet, you've got 20 or so miles under your belt. At the very end, you have the hardest part of the hike, which is the steep paved path up to the tram. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but it is pretty soul crushing to uh, have to do one last steep uphill and watch people uh, eating ice cream cones and French fries. But that'll be you soon. We're almost there. Now, as you get higher up the paved path, you're gonna see the tram station. Once you're up at the tram station, you can go to the restaurants. There's a couple of different restaurants. There's a bar. Here's the San Jacinto sign. You just walk right into there and walk up the stairs and you should be all set. I always like to have a drink or some kind of celebratory snack before I start heading back down. And when you get in the tram, it's kind of surreal. They usually play music. On this day, they were playing Sweet Caroline, and everyone in the tram was singing. It's always kind of a fun thing to go back down, but it's also a little surreal going, going down the cable car. There is the Kaufman's Crag that we passed earlier. It's a little surreal going down thousands of feet in a matter of minutes when you climbed up this, uh, you know, one canyon over not too long ago. That's the hike. I hope you found the guide helpful. If you did enjoy it, if you'd consider supporting the channel, I appreciate it. Uh, do all of these videos by user uh, support. So no ads, no sponsorships, no BS in here. So thank you, thank you, thank you. If you can do that, there's ways to do it without paying to. Uh, it's all on the webpage, hikingguy.com forward slash support. If you have any questions or you want to leave a trip report, do it on the comments on YouTube. That way everyone can see and benefit from whatever question you have or insight you might have. Uh, it helps everybody and gives back to the community. So thank you for that. 
And uh, I'm gonna go take a shower, eat about four cheeseburgers, four beers, bottle of wine, and a couple hot fudge sundaes, and uh, call it a day. All right, guys, I'll see you out in the trails.